Ever wondered what the real world performance difference would be between the base model M1 Pro MacBook Pro and a high-end M1 Max MacBook Pro? Well, in this video, we put those two machines up against each other in a few real world style tests and benchmarks to see the performance difference between the two laptops. Now, I say real world as in these are just workflows that I would use or what other people might use uh, for their various professional or creative jobs. Um, and that's what these laptops were designed for. So hopefully this will help. It's not gonna be perfect, but it should give you an idea. Super quick, for reference, the 14 inch MacBook Pro model that's used here is the base model. This means it has a M1 Pro chip, an eight core CPU, 14 core GPU, and 16 gigs of RAM. Our M1 Max machine is a 16 inch MacBook Pro with a 10 core CPU, 32 core GPU, and 32 gigabytes of RAM. Now, obviously I am fully expecting the M1 Max machine to outperform, but I'm just mostly curious how much of a performance difference one machine might have over the other. I was also curious if specific specs were more important than others, like should you get more CPU cores for certain activities or more GPU, RAM, etc. So hopefully these benchmarks can paint a better picture for you. And if you're wondering at checkout which one you should upgrade to, well, hopefully this video will give you the answers you need. Now, starting with a workflow that I use on a daily basis as a video editor, and that's rendering timelines in Final Cut Pro, as well as exporting the final project at the end. These are easily two of the most time consuming parts of my job uh, that I'm not actually doing anything. I'm waiting for the machine to finish up. And so when adding an adjustment layer with a LUT over top, which you know, is something that is pretty taxing on most machines if you have a lot of effects and LUTs on your timeline, um, this timeline is roughly six minutes. It's a 4K timeline and the render took about 55 seconds on the M1 Max and one minute and 22 seconds on the M1 Pro. Next comes exporting the video in my normal 4K MP4 settings that I would use to upload to YouTube. The file ends up being a few gigs in size. And as I mentioned before, the real time length of this video is around six minutes. And both computers finished exporting in blazing fast time with the M1 Pro coming in at two minutes and 55 seconds. But the M1 Max basically cuts that in half coming in at only one minute and 49 seconds. Now the phrase time is money definitely paints a picture here, and the M1 Max can definitely save you a lot of time, assuming you are working in some pretty similar conditions to what I have set up here. Now, the M1 Max does come with those extra GPU cores, which is definitely what's helping you out in this specific scenario. Now, let's say you're a video editor who uses a lot of 8K footage. I myself do not use 8K right now, but if you do, and you're wondering if the MacBook Pro can even handle playing streams of 8K raw footage without any drop frames, which Apple claims it does, well, that answer is kind of. The M1 Max is more than capable of handling 8K footage with pretty much no issues at all. I think I might have noticed one instance of a dropped frame. It might not have fully rendered when I clicked play, so that's not totally fair, but I was able to go through various red raw footage settings during playback, adjust exposure, white balance, etc., all on the fly, while the video was playing with Final Cut's better quality settings, AKA not optimized for performance, uh, and this laptop just tore through everything with no hiccups. I even added an adjustment layer to this project file with a custom LUT and could pause and play the footage with near instant playback and zero drop frames or lag, which is something I could not do on a lot of other machines, especially Intel Max. Now, on the flip side, the M1 Pro did have a few issues with drop frames and stuttering, but and this really pains me to say this because I love this machine, but there's really no way my Intel Mac Pro from 2017 could handle 8K footage this well. Even though the M1 Pro wasn't flawless like the M1 Max was, it was able to catch up and correct its issues as the video played on and was doing a very impressive job. I think ultimately the extra GPU cores here got the best of the M1 Pro machine, but it's still very impressive nonetheless. All right, for those who are into music production, I did a test of just a basically 100 MIDI tracks in a project. I cranked up the samples to 1024 and made sure the max amount of cores 
for this machine, which is eight, was being used at one time. Uh, because this is mostly going to reflect a bit more on the CPU with music production over the GPU like you would for video editing. Now with this test, you kind of just want to let the project play until the system overloads, and that actually never happened, not one bit. 100 tracks simultaneously, never once skipped, stuttered, lagged, nothing for both models. This was very impressive. And then I exported this song out and the M1 Pro, it took roughly 54 seconds to finish exporting that track. Um, the actual track was around a minute in length, so it was pretty much up in real time. The M1 Max finished exporting in 44 seconds, so about a 10 second difference. Not totally sure if it's worth the extra money for those two extra CPU cores for this specific test, but yeah, that was the difference for music production with rendering and exporting and even playing back that very large sampled timeline. Speaking of CPU tests, next up we tested the CPU in Blender. For those who work a lot with 3D modeling, getting an image rendered out can take quite a bit of time. And this is probably where one of the biggest differences lies with these two machines, especially when we're looking at the CPU differences. This image of a classroom was 3D rendered in eight minutes and 23 seconds using Blender on the M1 Max, while the M1 Pro finished almost three minutes later, coming in at 10 minutes and 58 seconds. If you're doing this quite a bit throughout the day, you can definitely see where spending the extra money on more cores would certainly help pay off in the long run. Finally, I did some quick real world tests, things that I come across on a daily basis or just the way I use my machines for both the RAM and the SSD. And I was absolutely not surprised that each machine performed pretty much exactly the same in the SSD department because they are very similar SSDs, if not the same. But I was surprised that each machine performed the same in my real world RAM management testing, considering one machine has 16 gigs of RAM and the other has 32 gigs. Now I didn't throw a whole lot at each because again, this is just the workflow and stuff that I use on a daily basis where I might notice other Intel machines have problems. So I guess it's not a definitive end all be all test, but what I did was open up most of my used applications that I would have at any given time together. Uh, these were not all opened just to be opened, but more of a workflow of apps that I usually use and have all together. Something like Mail App, Music, Final Cut Pro and or Lightroom at the same time, Chrome and Safari. Yes, I often use both of these at the same time. My Notes app and Messages. What I did for this test was use my computer as I normally would. I was editing a photo, jumping back between the other apps, have music playing, uh, and there was absolutely no hiccups during this process. All of the other apps, lots of tabs open where it usually says uh, it's using up a significant amount of memory. Um, everything was handled just fine. And using Lightroom was also a great experience, which usually isn't the case when you have everything else open. I was able to have heavy presets added to my photos, look at them in real time, change between a bunch of them, export, even checked memory statistics during this process. And while the memory load was increasing, everything remained cool, calm, and collected. For SSD tests, I transferred a run of the mill 125 gigabyte video folder from an external SSD to my internal SSD and both machines finished transferring in roughly under 50 seconds. The M1 Max at 43 and the M1 Pro right there at 44 seconds. Transferring from an SD card to an internal SSD is a bit slower, but both machines were the same with the process finishing up right around five minutes. For reference, it was a 29 gigabyte file transferred from one of these extreme 128 gigabyte memory cards that transfer right around 150 megabytes per second. And yeah, that was pretty much it. All of this was done over the last few days. And since day one of using these machines, the internal fans have still never kicked on. They've been completely silent, which is absolutely remarkable. For those who want the true Geekbench numbers, if you care about them, here they are. You do have quite a bit of a drastic difference in GPU performance scores, which is obviously to be expected, as there are far more cores on this machine than the base model M1 Pro. And it does show up quite a bit in real world testing with video editing and exporting and stuff like that. But when it comes to CPU scores, they might be different in benchmark scores, but the CPU on the base model M1 Pro versus the 10 core M1 Max is pretty neck and neck in my real world testing, at least 
for most of the other things besides Blender and that 3D image rendering. Of course, I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments down below. We're going to be doing a video of the M1 Pro base model versus the M1 base model MacBook Pro. But if you wanna see the M1 Max up against the Mac Pro or another machine, go ahead and let me know in the comments down below. This has been Dan with Mac Rumors. Thanks so much for watching and I hope to see you around in the next video.